all insufficiency. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your, your humility and your love for us that you would die on a cross for our sins, Lord. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you for your sacrifice. And Lord, today we just ask God, we wanna be more like you. We wanna be conformed to your image. We wanna look like Jesus to the world. And uh, as we just approach this topic of humility, God, it's just so at the essence of your character. I pray, Holy Spirit, would you come and give us revelation of what it means to be humble. Would you give us a new revelation of what it would look like to walk like Jesus in humility and love? And so we ask, Lord, would you speak through Pastor Greg this morning? I pray that our hearts would, would be moldable this morning, God, that, that walls would come down, that all defensiveness would just be silenced in the name of Jesus, that we could hear your word and we could apply it to our lives, God. We're hungry for more of you and we want to look more like you, our King, and we worship you and praise you with all of our, our attention, all of our hearts, God, we give it to you now. So come and speak, we ask in the name of Jesus, amen. You may be seated. So fun. Love that thing. Good morning. Well, let's try that one again. Good morning. Good morning. Morning, morning everybody at home and online and outside. We're glad you guys are with us. Uh, before we dive into the message this morning, I want to take a minute because I've um, got an announcement that concerns our summer and want to make sure that uh, you guys are all heads up since it'll be coming in a couple of weeks here. And that is that the elders have granted me and uh, my family a sabbatical for, the, for three months over the summer. So from June 6th to September 4th, I'll be back on September 4th preaching. And so there'll be a gap there so, uh, of preaching. Now, some people freak out. Like I met a bunch of different people during service who are like, I mean, she's leaving. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not leaving. Um, in, all, in all honesty, this is an opportunity that our policy allows us to take um, every seven years or so a sabbatical. And so in order to just kind of con connect and re you know, get back with the Lord, get reconnected. And this is honestly intentional for, for me and my family. Um, they, we are guaranteed we'll be here. For, you know, you, to take a sabbatical, you have to be here for two years after that. So we're not going anywhere. Um, definitely, that's not the goal. My, my case is that over the last few months it's been um since actually COVID, which was not fun for anybody, amen? It was like, a, it's been really tough three years. And one of the hard things about that time period was it unsurfaced a lot of stuff, a lot of um, sorrow, a lot of pain, a lot of hard work. Then there's just been a, a bit of burnout that's kind of set in and to the point where, to be honest, sometimes we're sitting there with the best team I've, I've ever had here at Olive Branch. And I'm going like, woohoo, yay, I'm so excited. You know, that's honestly kind of the level of energy I've had it many times. And so trying to get some rest and also trying to just deal with one other factor that um, throughout this time, it's revealed to me uh, that, you know, I've been working from probably an unhealthy place for many, many years. And I want to really get that health in. So we're going to be checking in with some counselors, getting some, working on some internal stuff, some of my, my own history and things, because I want to come back and be able to lead from a position of health like I've never been able to lead before. That's what I get really excited about is being able to give you guys the better part of who I am and not the back half of who I am in so many different ways. And so that'll be a, a portion of it. And also just giving my family and me some time to reconnect. Now, once again, some of you guys are going like, well, what does that mean? Well, it means we're going to shut down the entire summer. We're not even going to have church. No, that's not what's going on. Um, we've got some awesome speakers that are coming in. Gina Avildabil, our family director, worked really hard pulling in some, some people. We've got um, some, some of my, actually one of my mentors, Doug Hughes, will be here. He'll do one of the sermons. We've got uh, Kent Cranning from some of those who knew 
him at the uh, men's retreat a few years ago. He's coming in for a couple sermons, and we've got uh, just a bunch of in-house guys that are really awesome, pa- old pastors that sit amongst us. They're going to be stepping up, and we'll have some others as well. We'll be starting our spiritual growth, or season of spiritual growth that's coming at the end of that, we'll be jumping into looking at prayer. And so I'll be coming in, picking up a couple sermons in there at the end, or sorry, the last four of those, and we'll be off and running. So it's going to take some time. But here's what I'm asking for from you guys. First and foremost is just pray for me and my family, that we can get that rest, that we can get that uh, spiritual refreshment and um, really rebuild some things that have gotten uh, broken over the years. And then also that uh, you would be continuing to come to church, invite your friends, love, live, and share Christ. One of the most powerful things about sabbaticals with pastors is that it can oftentimes open the eyes of the congregation of how unimportant this dude actually is. And what's cool about that is you realize how critical you as the congregation, you as those who volunteer, you as those who engage in evangelism, you as those who are actually running the Bible studies and, and our other staff members, how much that is so critical for the health and the life of the church. And that's what I'm praying for you guys, that you see growth, that you guys actually see some incredible things happen because you guys are on it. You are the ministers. I'm the water boy. I'm happy to be the water boy. And uh, we're excited to see what you guys can be doing. So do me that favor, please. Just continue to be on fire and be who you guys have been. It's been exciting, exciting to work with you guys. And I can't wait to get back and really dive in to where God has for us in our next season. So um, we do that for me, please. Can you just give me a, like a nod? Yeah, we're good. Okay, thank you guys. It gets nerve wracking for me to say that stuff, but we're gonna pray and then we're gonna dive into the word and uh, let's, uh, let's see what God has for us. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for Jesus who, who was the word incarnate on earth to teach us and lead us. Thank you, Jesus, that you sent the spirit into our hearts and into our lives that we may be transformed by your word, that we may have the ability to be changed by it. And precious Trinity, we ask that you would be engaged with us today, that you would indeed shape our hearts, move our minds, um, just enable us to walk from here in a pattern that is totally different than where we started. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. At the beginning of... um, this sermon, what I began to realize is that one of, stories, one of the stories Brent shared with me is really critical for us to grasp. And, and it kind of illustrates some of what I see as the problem in our current culture. He's telling me about a guy he, he, he knew who had um, some seats and they were sitting down at a, it was a particular baseball game. And in front of them was this young, this little old man kind of sitting there and the seat next to him was empty. And they could tell these were like those season, season seats. They're like great. They're amazing seats. And they're just like, Hey, like, where's your, you know, why is this empty? And he looked and says, Oh, me and my wife, we, we had season tickets all our lives and she just recently passed. And so, and they're like, Oh man, that that's horrible. Uh, so you, you couldn't find a friend to like join you to honor her. He's like, Oh no, they're all at the funeral. Um, Now, you got to remember, Brent told me that. So just, just keep that in mind. Uh, the, uh, but, but it illustrates something that, that can be awfully wrong in marriages, right? This idea that we can, we can get it all out of whack, putting, the, putting our own desires and our own focus in the wrong place. And you know what? That's been one of those things we're looking at as a culture and saying, hey, that seems to be growing. I mean, we are a culture that is a really um, self-oriented group of people. We saw that last week, but we're also a really proud group of people. I mean, I love a good 4th of July fireworks display. Anybody else enjoy that? And, you know, one of the songs I really love is like, I'm proud to be an American. When that comes on, you're just like, yeah, I want to stand up and, you know, that whole thing. And honestly, what's weird, though, is that the more you get away from the 4th of July, the more you start realizing, oh, wow, there's a lot of other things we Americans get proud about. Like we have an entire pride month. We have pride parades. We get proud about everything from our weight, our skin color, our sexual orientation to you name it. And we also then get proud individually. I mean, we're proud about how many people we have that follow us. We get proud about how many likes we get. We get proud about all of our social media posts. And pride is filled with our culture. And yet I grew up understanding a a quote And it was a quote I heard often. I don't know why I heard it all the time. Maybe my parents just liked to say it to me because I was arrogant and proud. But it was like they would say, pride comes before the 
fall. We all heard that proverb. It actually comes from the scriptures. It comes from Proverbs chapter 16, verse 18. It was a summation of this text. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And so they just summed it up as pride comes before a fall. Pride comes before your fall. And we begin to look around. We see all the pride and we see all this stuff. We see all the division. We see all these things. And we go, should we be surprised? If we have this much pride and it comes before destruction, before a fall, should we be surprised when we're running around touting how excited we are about our pride? And then we're like, but I'm lonely. And everybody's angry. And everybody's divided because we're all looking out for the wrong equation. Right, we saw this equation at the end of last week. We, we saw the equation as the problem being that we put me before you, right? And say, you, you would say you before anyone else. So it's like me, I put me before you. I come first, you do you. You know, it's all about me time. I'm, I'm, you know, I am enough. This kind of statements that float in our culture right now that make you so me-centric, so me-centered, And these things are floating around and dissolving relationships and harming our churches and our marriages and our friendships, some of which we've lost plenty of. And so what do we do? This is our problem that we've got this equation in this way and it's filling everything. The church needs to be very focused on the solution that Paul offered. And we saw that this is here in Philippians chapter two. So if you have your Bible, grab it with me, open it up. Philippians chapter two, we find the problems and the solution to your home. Open your app, grab your Bible outside, same thing. We'd love for you guys to get a pen ready, mark it up. You know, you wanna keep this stuff handy so you see it when you're going through and you're reading scriptures and you remember those things. So let's be sure as we're diving in here, we see this. So Philippians chapter two, well, we know Paul is writing to a church called Philippi and, or in Philippi, it's a military city. It is very pro-Roman and they are very angry that the church is proclaiming Christ as Lord. Now, Paul has found himself in jail and they've sent money to him. So he's writing this thank you letter back to them, but also imploring them saying, please, I know I'm saying thank you, but keep unified. There's two women who have kind of divided the church. They were probably the owners of the villas that the church has lived in. They were the sponsors of the church. And so Now there was this tension and he's going, guys, we can't have division. Make my joy complete. Be unified in mind. Be unified in soul. Be unified in your purpose, in your love. And then he goes on in verse three and he says, do nothing then from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And so what he does is he captures this idea and he says, here's the solution I'm proposing to the divisions that are caused in your church, to all the lack of love, to all the frustration and purpose. Here's what I want. I don't want new vision statements. I don't want you guys to do all these. No, the solution to the division is a humble lifestyle. Now, I don't mean just a lifestyle. He literally means a mindset. I use lifestyle because we don't talk mindsets much, but it is literally a way of life, a way of thinking, a way of examining and and considering all things around you. He says, I want that to be humility. In fact, the strange thing is in the text, it says, do nothing with selfish ambition or conceit, but, and it says, in humility. Another way to translate it is, then they they debate this because it's kind of difficult. It says, but in the humility, because it has the in front of it. As if you're stating the kind of life, this kind of mentality, this, this kind of mindset that's ab- absorb you is a humility that everybody should see. Now, humility is, is an idea, this mindset of basically thinking of yourself as not that big of a deal. In fact, let's just put it this way. The equation is the solution. And the equation is just to flip our problem last week and turn it around. It's the title of the series. The humility is really putting you before me. It is making sure all the yous in the world are before the me in the world. That's a lot more yous than there are me's. And so there's a lot more focus on other things. And suddenly there's a big difference in the way we approach things. I don't think I'm that great is the first point because there is a God who isn't me that I put first and he's great. Amen. Our God, in Jesus, Jesus Christ, our God is the great one. He is the one who is to be worshiped. He is the one who's worthy. He is the one who's sinless. I'm not. I'm not to be worshiped. I'm not the worthy one. You're not to be worshiped. You're not the worthy ones. God is. 
And yet humility starts with me acknowledging that, wow, God is greater than me, so I'm not all that in a bag of chips. But I can still then put you before me. I can place you before me because you know what? There's a lot of you out there. It makes me aware of you. I mean, it makes me clear about who you are. And I stopped treating cars as cars. And I realized there's drivers in those cars, right? When, when you were in traffic, that problem. Or maybe you've been in that situation where you're driving or you're about to get in line at the grocery store and you've got two items and somebody gets in front of you with a whole cart and you've got every thought in your head. They, they did that on purpose. I, I can't believe this. You're ready to like launch after them because you're not thinking about what they're struggling with or that they not just pay attention or whatever. Or, or how about this one? How many have ever received a text or some kind of... Um, I don't know, some kind of Facebook post or Instagram post or reply, and you read all of their intent into the sentence. Did you ever do that? It's the wrong inflection in the voice. It's like, hi, I can't stand you or whatever. That's how you're reading it. And it's really like, hey, we'd love to hang out with you at some point because I had a couple of questions. You're reading, hey, I'd love to hang out with you at some point because I have a couple of questions. You know, you can't write inflection into the text. Even you put emojis on there, it doesn't help you. And the point is that many of us insert our own thinking because we're thinking about ourselves more than we're thinking about others. I find oftentimes when I apply intent to somebody, it's typically an intent I have hidden in my heart. I just put it on them because that's what I would do. But then it might not be what they're doing. And so when we think of others before ourselves, when we put the you before me, then I start to realize there's a lot of other you's. There's a lot of other motivations. There's a lot of other reasons. That guy might have a, uh, have a pregnant wife he's driving to work. He might be late and about to lose his job. He, you know, there could be a thousand other reasons why he cut you off and sped past you or whatever. But when we put that, we give them the benefit of the doubt. We lean into this. And humility allows us to do these kinds of things. Now, the problem is humility wasn't liked in the Roman Empire, and it's not much like today. In fact, the Roman Empire, if you talk about humility, they thought of you as one idea. You were a doormat. Everybody think of humility in that way? It's like being servile. Like, in fact, the ancient Romans would talk about it as if you had no ability to control yourself. But when somebody said, go do something, you're like, yes, sir. And you went and did it. Humility is this is the thought of in many cases in our current culture is not not defending yourself as always apologizing as groveling as you being the low person on the totem pole it's ugly and disgusting no you got to fight your way up you got to be on top you got to be proud all this stuff is our culture we don't like humility and yet here's the thing humility isn't being a doormat humility isn't just letting everybody walk all over you if that's the case, some of you might be in a situation where you're, you're going to allow yourself to be abused. And that can't be the case. Being humble doesn't mean we don't draw boundaries, doesn't mean we don't protect ourselves, doesn't mean we, we apologize when somebody doesn't like what we believe. And I've heard a lot of people apologizing for Christian beliefs to our culture. It's like, don't apologize for what we believe. That's not humble. Because the first person we're humble to is to God. Then we're humble to others. And we have to keep that in right order. Notice how Peter puts it. He's telling us, be humble to each other. He says, clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility towards one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Notice your reasoning for humbling yourself is because God's the one who opposes it. God's the one who's against the proud. God's the one who wants to be humble. So he continues, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God so that at the proper time, he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. And so suddenly we realize, hey, I, I've got to submit myself first to God and then humble to people and I won't be a doormat. In fact, you'll be able to draw a line where God draws a line because you have to say, I submit to God, I'm humble to God before I'm humble to anybody else. Does that make sense? Otherwise, you and I will end up becoming groveling in the wrong places. We'll end up humbled in the wrong directions. We may apologize for a boundary or something like that. Now, the second part is that when you do this and you humble yourself first to God, it changes things. For example, you don't need to win. You don't necessarily need to win every argument. 
You don't need to win every contest that you're involved in. God knows who the real winner and real loser is in every argument that's ever gone on in every household, amongst every friend, and amongst every church. Amen? Do we all agree with that? And there is a day coming in which there will be a judgment in which we will all stand before God and that argument will be brought up and yes, Brent will be vindicated, not, no, Nancy will be, right? And my wife will be, no, it's, God will know and God will bring it out. Now, when you understand God's in charge, when you believe God knows what he's talking about, when you believe God has got it down and you're able to humble yourself, even in an argument, now you've opened yourself up to not having to be right, but expose yourself to the opportunity to allow God to handle. Now you can forgive now you can engage in other kinds of activities. And this kind of grows from there, but it starts with humility before God because then we realize even you and me are not as good as God. We're all sinners. We're all broken. We all need the same gospel. We all need the same Jesus. And that is something that disables us from becoming arrogant and above one another. Now, there's another issue here with humility, and that is that we can fall into this concept of humility where you and I are engaged in this kind of servile stuff. And he says, no, 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 draw your boundaries, humble to God first, then humble to people. The other side is to be falsely humble. You ever met any false, humble people? Like, you know, they're usually like six-year-olds. I'm no good at that soccer stuff. And he's like the best on the team. And you're like, yes, yes, you are, son. You're real good at that. And you're like, that's called false humility. We're running around, you know, kind of beating yourself up because you're just looking for somebody to encourage you. Oh, I'm not pretty. Yes, you are. You're the prettiest girl in the whole school. You know, that whole kinds of things, right? This stuff happens all over the place. We're, and we all do it in these subtle different ways where we kind of put ourselves down. In fact, sadly, pastors were really good at this stuff. I mean, the one pastor used to say he hated the sermon, the end of the sermon, because he had to get off the stage and go through what he called the glorification of the worm, where he had to walk through and people go like, well done, pastor, that was the best thing. Well, bless your heart. That was the coolest illustration I ever, you know, whatever it was in his particular church. And he'd just sit there going, this is ridiculous. Worship God, don't worship me, was his mentality. Now, what's interesting is that we can end up doing that wrongly, where you're walking around going like, yeah, yeah, no, you know, it's all God, it's all him. And it's just like, no, sir, you got to, and you're really trying to egg it on. And this is a heart condition we have to be careful about. False humility is just pride dressed up in a different garb. And so we're not talking about that either. In fact, you're not supposed to push yourself down, but you're not supposed to put yourself up. Paul in Romans chapter 12 put it this way, by the grace of God given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment about each according to the measure of faith that God has given. You should think rightly about yourself. Don't deny that you're good at something. What does that do? It means you're a liar. Right? I mean, I, I love Kevin. Kevin, um, Kevin Kane, when he worked here, one of, one of the first early months that I met him, we were standing out there and somebody observed um, after a class he had taught, they're like, wow, Kevin, you're a really good teacher. He says, thanks. Yeah, I know. And people are like, wow, that is arrogant. And, he's, and she said, it. she's like, that is so arrogant. He's like, no, I'm not meaning to be arrogant. I'm just acknowledging that what you said was right. It was true. I've had that told me a lot. It's like, well, you want me to put myself down? You want me to say, no, I'm not. I'm not good at this. Just thank you. I appreciate that. And, uh, cool guess or what, you know, it's like, he was really funny about it. But his point was like, look, I'm comfortable being good at something. I don't need to put myself down. I don't, I'm not trying to put myself up. I'm just saying, yeah, you're right. That's, eh, we're good. And it's so weird for some of us because we're like, Ugh, don't toot your horn. Don't, you know, yeah, don't toot your horn. I'm not saying that. And don't gain your value from it. You know, sometimes you'll gain a compliment. And what you need to do with it is accept it, receive it, then give it to the Lord. And then if you find yourself building on it, throw it in the trash. Don't build your background off it. Don't build your life off your compliments, but acknowledge, you know, some of you are really gifted at some things. We run around as Christians trying to deny all of what we're gifted from that God gave you so you don't even worship him for it. And so I want to challenge that because here's the thing. Understand yourself rightly. And I like, I heard this first from Tim Keller. Now I'm going to humble myself because my wife was correct. Uh, she, she corrected me during service. She said, it's not Tim Keller. This was C.S. Lewis. Okay, well, I read it from Tim Keller quoting C.S. Lewis. So we're in good company here, okay? And this is what he said. Humility is not when we think less of ourselves, but think about ourselves less. It's not when you think less of yourself. 
It's not beating yourself up. It's just thinking about other people more than you. It's considering others before yourself, considering you before me. It is this walking around where I, I just kind of have forgotten myself. In the particular sermon I'm speaking of here, Tim Keller talks about the, the ache of your leg. You know, when your knee starts to hurt as you get older, when you're a kid, you didn't know you owned knees, right? Knees were things that moved and they bounced around and they gave you all this energy. When you're old, you're like, I have a knee. Ow, there's a knee here. I didn't know I owned that knee. I didn't know I had that muscle. Right. When things are right, when they're not hurting, you don't notice them. And proud people notice their hurting souls and so they notice themselves. Humility is the ability to be just right where you're at and comfortable where you're at because you're concerned about other people. So you don't have to necessarily sit around in a false humility. And so what I'm going to challenge you guys to consider is in your, in your relationships, in your marriage with your children, maybe your parents, maybe it's sibling relationships or a friendship or a dating relationship, that you need to aim at becoming humble, putting that other person before you. And right there, if I said that right, some of you are going like, uh, say what? I am not putting... Mr. I'm sitting next to or Mrs. I'm sitting next to first. Do you know them? Why should I have to go first? It's a question that's often asked, especially in marriage counseling when things are really bad. Why should I go first? I'm just going to put it this way. Men, I think you should go first. I think God's called you as the men to go first, to humble yourself first. Just, just to be clear. I think he's put us in a leadership position and therefore you should go first. But ladies, I think you should also go first. See, you're not making any sense. One person has to go first, Greg, and it can't, it can't be both of us. Well, let me put it this way. I think we should both all consider going first all at the same time because Jesus went first above all. And if we want to be Christians, that means we want to be like Christ. Which doesn't mean, doesn't matter whether you're in the leadership position or whether you're in the follower position or whether you're the head or not or whatever, all that stuff. No, the bottom line is you follow Jesus and Jesus went first. Look down at verse eight with me here. In chapter two, Paul then picks up, he begins to illustrate all of these things using the life of Jesus. And he says, now, Jesus emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Stop there and think about that for a minute. Jesus humbled himself before who? Well, we could say first he humbled himself before the Father. Christianity believes in a trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are three persons of one God. One God who is one being. And yet, so Jesus is Equal with the Father in glory, equal with the Father in power, equal with the Father in knowledge, equal with the Father in all ways. And yet what Jesus did is he humbled himself to obey the Father. And so he did so by coming to the cross and dying on the cross. for him. And in that act, he also did something else. He humbled himself and lifted us up so that we were thought of as more important than some, than than himself. And so he, be, he put us first in his humility. And so if Jesus went first. I can be willing to go first. Now notice what happened to Jesus. It's for, he went to the cross, right? Which means when you humble yourself, you take a risk, serious risk of being hurt. Yes, you do. And it can hurt. And it may hurt. And it probably will hurt to humble yourself in your pride, to humble yourself in your ambitions and let things go to put someone else first. But remember, Jesus did it first. And he is our example for us because it's not worthless. The thing we fear is that when we humble ourselves, the other person will not reciprocate. They won't humble themselves in return. And so you wind up with somebody who grows in arrogance because you're willing to humble them, try to control you. But again, you hum you're humble to God before you're humble to others. And so if that person tries to do something that's outside of God, you know, you humble yourself before the Lord. In this case, then, realize, though, even if that other person doesn't ever rightly humble themselves, there is a reward in eternity. And I clarify this. It's a reward in eternity. I don't think it'd be a reward really rewarded right now. 
It took after the cross, he says, God therefore highly exalted him and bestowed on him every name that is the name that is above every name. Jesus was rewarded and that reward lasts forever. I don't want a reward on earth if I can get one in eternity that goes on forever. Amen. Too many people bank too much time on the short little years we got left of our lives thinking, oh, if I get blessing now, it's going to be so good to waste all that opportunity for eternal blessing. I don't know. Let's calculate that out a little bit. I'll find, I think you'll find the dividends are very different. And so, yeah, I think it's absolutely worth the dividends of a return on investment of humility now for an eternal reward later. But there will be pain. It will be difficult. But Jesus stepped forward first. And when we do that, what happens is it changes things. It changes conflict. Years ago, I was in a parking lot going somewhere. I don't remember what, I was probably at Home Depot or I don't quite remember, but I ran into my cousin and I'm like, hey, cousin, what's going on? And she had just gotten married like a couple years earlier and we'd done some of their counseling stuff. Maybe it was even a year earlier and this things were not going well. And she stopped me in that parking lot. She's like, oh, this is what's going on. We're always fighting and, da, 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 da. and she's laying it all out. And she, she looks at me, she's like, you're a pastor. What do I do? And I'm like, oh, great, that line, you know, it's like, you're a pastor, you have all the answers. So I, I just was like, I don't know, Lord. And what came out of my mouth was this, want him to win. She's like, what? I'm like, just want him to win for once. How about you want him to win the argument? And if he would want you to win the argument, guess what would happen? You'd both actually sit down and consider each other's arguments for a minute to see if they're valid. See if they're worth anything. The problem is you both want to dig in and stand there and hold your ground and I'm not moving and you're wrong and you're wrong. But if you say, well, I kind of want you to win. Now you have to consider what they're saying. It's an action of humility. Why don't you just put his argument before yours for a minute and see what happens? And vice versa. What happens when suddenly we listen? We enter into a learning ability. We begin to process information differently. And we become much like James says about the kind of wisdom that comes from heaven. The bad stuff, the demonic stuff was this selfish ambition and this kind of standing here conceited model. And then James goes on after explaining that to us. He goes, that's all from the demons. That's all the bad stuff. Hey, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and open to reason means willing to consider the other is is the idea there. Full of mercy, not willing to judge, but kind of given some grace. Like, I know you said that really meanly. What did you really mean by that? It's going to have good fruits. It's going to be impartial. Well, I'm not going to judge this at the beginning and consider I'm right or you're right. I'm going to keep it open. I don't mean sincere. I don't think you're right, but I'm still willing to consider it. It's from this concept, you'll just get into this text. If you're struggling and you really study this text, this will be good homework for you because you'll discover the route that God allows for all kinds of conflict to be resolved because it produces a harvest of righteousness because you become a peacemaker. And what we want to be is a people engaged in making peace. And that means we need to be slow to speak, slow to anger, quick to listen, because the bottom line is we understand that, hey, I'm willing to go first. I'm willing to shift my mindset to a humble one. Another aspect is that we can say, I'm willing to do this for the sake of our marriage, for the sake of our friendship, for the sake of our church. And so I'm I'm willing to confess my sin. Do you realize confession of sin is an extremely humble thing to do? If you've never had to confess your sins, The reason probably why is you're either afraid or too proud. To humble yourself enough to actually confess your sin and admit you're wrong is ridiculously difficult. And I hate it. And I could write a book on how to eat crow. And you could all join me and add recipes, right? Because we're all going to do this together. And the goal is that we would be good at being people who understand we mess up and we're willing to admit our sin. We're willing to lay it out there and say, I hurt you. I lost this trust. I broke, I did this sin and I broke our vows. Whatever it is, you can speak it, not just, hey, I'm sorry I yelled at you the other day. That's, that's apologizing for the way you did something. How about apologizing for actually being wrong? How about apologizing for actually having lied. I mean, be very specific. That's hard. You know what's harder? 
to receive a confession. When you receive a confession, you have every desire in you to judge and push them down because it's usually sinned against you. But if you put the humble position, you realize I have things I need to confess too in my life and things that I've confessed and forgiveness then erupts in your soul because now you can forgive. And guess what? You know how much tension in marriages would be gone if we just had some intimate confession and forgiveness? See what happens when you're actually willing to do that? You expose your soul in your most vulnerable, scary place called your wickedness. And when you are received in your wickedness and loved there, intimacy grows. Because if they can accept you there, if they can love you in that mess and forgive you, then you're able to move forward, knowing each other even better. This is true for all relationships, sibling and otherwise, and it starts with humility. And I want us to cultivate humility. I think it should be cultivated in our souls and our lives. And so Paul kind of erupts even more on this. He kind of develops it a little bit more by saying, here's how you should think if you think in humility. Humility thinks in this way. It thinks you, and I changed the equation, are greater than me. There's some math for you up there. You are greater than me. Notice how he puts it in, in the verses. Verse three. Do nothing from selfish ambition, more conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Now that word count is a weird word because when you read it, you're like, oh, I got to count others more significant than me. I got to feel like they're better than me. I got to feel like they're greater than me. It's not a feeling word at all. In fact, it's a leadership word. There's a weird thing. The word count means to sit down and make an account, to consider all and weigh all your options and then make, as a leader, to make the best decision considering your options. It is literally a cerebral act, not a feelings act. And this is critical because some of you hear this and you read this and you think, oh, that means I got to be less important if I make somebody else more important. You know, it's a lot like ice cream in my house. The other day we go out, we buy ice cream. I don't know why I do this to myself. We come home, we eat ice cream. Sit down and there's just a little bit of ice cream left and I know it's in the fridge, in the freezer. We shut that thing, I go to bed and I'm thinking in the back of my mind, I can't wait to get home from work. I'm gonna have me some ice cream. I have four children. Like I said, I don't know why I think that. I'm a glutton for punishment because every time dinner's over and I go over there, I'm like, hee hee, there's gonna be ice cream. And I'm like, I open it up and who ate all the ice cream? Oh, I ate a little bit. I didn't, I didn't stop. Everybody's got a reason why they ate a little bit more of the ice cream. I'm the only one to get any ice cream. And I bought the ice cream. Who's eating my ice cream? Anybody ever feel that way? Anybody ever had that happen, right? Okay. That's how we think when it comes to importance. We think somehow if you got to lift somebody up, you've just given away a little bit of the pie of importance. And there's only so much importance to go around the world. That's not how it works. You don't drop yourself and lower yourself and and destroy your value in order to lift somebody else up. You don't put yourself down in order to make somebody else look better. You don't put other people down to make somebody else look better. No, what you do is you count others more significant than yourself. You say, well, Greg, how do we do that? You do it like Jesus did it. Verse five, look at it now with me. He says, have this mind amongst yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not Count, there's our word, equality with God, a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Now, before you get too confused, let's, let's, let's kind of flesh this out for a second. Jesus Christ was in the form of God. Some of your Bibles will read the nat- it was by nature God. Uh, the term morphe or the word form in this is a picture of either the very essence of what something is or the vestments by which they expressed their nature. So in the case of the Roman world, the way you dress dictated what level of status you were in. And the only one who got to dress like a god, quote unquote, in the ancient world was the Roman emperor who dressed in full purple and toga. He is the only one allowed to wear a full purple toga. No one else. And it was the vestments of deity is how they thought of it. 
And so if he took off his vestments, he was emptying himself of his deity in that sense. Well, Jesus here is the one who is God. He's in very nature God. He's wearing the vestments of God and he's looking around and he is God. And he's going like, I'm not going to hold on to this thing. I'm not going to grasp it greedily like some robber who's held on to that thing and not going to let it go even if it gets rusted. The point here is that we always say absolute power corrupts what? Absolutely, except for Jesus. Because Jesus had absolute power. And he looked down at all of us who were dying and going to hell and he goes, compared to this, I'm going to count holding on to my power and my deity and all the service and the ability to do whatever I want because I'm God. I'm not gonna count this as more important to grip onto than human beings that I would love to see know me. And so he, quote, empties himself. But he doesn't literally give up anything. He puts on something by taking the form of a human being. He didn't lose any of his attributes. All, this gets into some detailed theology stuff. You don't need to worry about it. The bottom line is that in his, in his willingness to humble himself and his willingness to come and count us more important, he didn't deny his deity. He didn't go like, well, I'm not going to be God anymore. No, he was still God. And so in essence, what he did is he leaned down and pulled us up. He didn't become less than us to push us up. We don't have to put people down. You can know who you are perfectly well. You can understand exactly who you are and you can stand firm on that and you can be clear about who you are and then pull someone up because you can see how they have attributes better than you. You can see how they have an importance more than you. Because everybody here has an importance more than everybody else at some place. And so it doesn't diminish our importance. It actually multiplies it. Sort of like my, my wife likes to make sourdough bread. Any sourdough bread makers in here? Right? You got starter? Man, you just, that starter just keeps making more bread. I mean, I'm like, starter's like Jesus. It multiplies bread. It's amazing, right? This is just incredible. But when you lift someone else up and you lift someone else up and then they lift you up and then you lift them up and up and up and up and up and up. You end up multiplying the importance and the care and the love of each other. And you start to develop this kind of reality where we are not minimizing anyone. We're not crushing anyone. We're actually multiplying the importance of people. And give me I'll give you an illustration. This last week we had the, the, this, the start of this, you know, a little bumper. <laughs> You know, it's a little cute thing. And I'm like, oh, Jacob did this great job. And well, at the staff meeting, Jacob was like, hey, I really appreciate that. That uh, he said I did a good job. But I just want to let you know, Yvette really helped out on this. And she deserves honor for, for what she did and as she did this too. And I was like, oh, wow. This is a perfect picture. He didn't diminish what he did, but he picked Yvette up and pushed her into a position where like, she really deserves, deserves a lot of praise for that. And I was just like, that is the perfect picture of what we're talking about. And suddenly you turn it around. This is how you care for each other. Spouses, you begin to turn and you see the good in each other and you lift it up. You care about each other and you, you pull it up. And here's the problem that's really hard if you're married because some, the very thing you often fell in love with is the thing you can't stand. Anybody notice that? This, isn't, this can sometimes translate into friendships. It definitely translates into, into siblings. But the, the, the bottom line is that with a marriage, you're like, oh my gosh, you're so awesome. I just love how organized you are and you're, you know exactly what you're doing when you do it. And it's just like attractive. You're like, this is so cool. And then you're like seven years into the marriage or two, whatever. And you're like, what do you mean? I can't put my stuff on the floor. Why are you so rigid? You're so anal all the time. We got to always be with everywhere on time. And you got to, all of a sudden, all that organization you loved is not so much loved. And then the, all you free lovers are like, woo, I love laughing. and we're having fun. And, and they're like, I just, you just make me adventurous. And it's just so much fun to be around you because you're just freewheeling. And you, why can't you do anything on time? Why can't you clean up? You are so lazy. You don't pull, you don't stay on any, right? All the same attributes are flipped. The very thing you can't stand is often the very thing you love and vice versa. And what I'm calling you guys to is to stop and realize the goal forward in humility is to learn to encourage one another in the truth. Stop seeing all the negative side of these attributes. Stop seeing all the negative side of these gifts. Start building each other, encouraging each other. Now, 
I need to be clear. The scriptures tell you and me to encourage each other, to build one another up, just as in fact we are doing, right? That's the, the text here. And encourage can be encourage as in like you lean in in a hard time and you're like, you can do this, let's go, we got this. Or it can be exhortation where you're standing on the sidelines going, yo, go, 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 yeah. So that's exhortation or encouragement, comfort, it's all the same terms. We're supposed to be doing this to each other, but we have a tendency rather to be more critically minded as humans, to see each other's negatives, point out how you can grow. You know, oh, I'm, just, I'm, not, I'm just trying to help you out here, you know, but we really can be very negative. And what we need to watch is, hey, God's calling us to become encouragers, but don't lie about it. I don't know about you. The worst kind of encouragement is the kind that you know is fake. Am I agreed on that one? Right? You kind of like, they go like, oh, and they tell you this, and you're like, something smells real bad about that encouragement. That was a lie. Liar. But you're not going to tell them liar. You know, like, you're, and here's the thing. Some of you guys have a habit of encouraging people in things that aren't true. That's not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to encourage each other in the truth. Notice in Philippians chapter four, Paul says, here's some things that we should put our minds on. If we have a mindset of humility, this fills in that mindset in some way. Here's what we should think about these things. He says, finally, brothers, whatever is, what? Say this word with me. Whatever is, one more time. Whatever is, one more time. Whatever is, true. True. Whatever is, true. If they can't sing well, you don't go, you are the most beautiful singer I've ever heard. Liar. True. Because it's so much more worth it. What enables us to do then is what is the true things we're looking for? Whatever's honorable. Man, is it true that they honored, they couldn't sing, but they honored the Lord with what they were doing? Yeah, man, honor the, man, I love how you just honored the Lord with your heart. Whatever is just, I love how you dealt with that with our kids. That was so just. That was the perfect discipline or the perfect encouragement. Whatever is pure, not seemly and dirty and nasty. Whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. If there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, these things are true. Man, at least encourage those things. Think about those things. Build those things up. Guys, what happens in a church if we stop for a minute and realize that all of you guys are far more important than any of the pastors on stages? Can we just make this clear for a minute? Pastors have a hard time convincing people of this. It's like, oh no, you're the pastor, you preach. Look, I do what all of you hated in language arts. I write an essay every week and then deliver it, okay? It's horrible. That's all I do. How important is everybody else in this church? Um, I'm not watching your kids this morning. Who's changing your kid's dirty diaper right now? I mean, there are people making sure that everybody at home is able to watch, that cameras are running, that things are being changed, that sound is going through. Some of them are staff, some of them are volunteers. I mean, there's an entire room of teenagers somewhere with adults with them. Those are some important people. let alone how many of you are running small groups, teaching each other in studies, helping each other in counseling, doing all kinds of service for the poor and those around us through various ministries. What we forget is that you have beautiful gifts that are far more important. You go to work and you have an engagement that no staff member can ever have and the opportunity to share the gospel. And the opportunity to make an influential mark for Jesus Christ. That is far more important than the water boy on stage going, go, 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 and here's some water. You know, that, I'm the equipment guy. I equip you and you go do the important work of ministry. And what's beautiful about that is, yes, my preaching is important. It's the equipment. But what you do with it is 10,000 times more powerful. And when we grasp that, can you imagine a church as you're walking around and you realize, you have this gift. You have this gift. Oh, you have that gift. Oh man, I wish I had that gift. That gift's awesome. Oh, and I like my gifts too, but your gift, that's a great gift. That's a, that's a, like, think about it. If we were running around encouraging each other in our giftedness. I mean, all of us would be serving somewhere because it's just like, 
All you're doing is constantly running around. Everybody's telling like, that, that's your gift. I totally see it. That's awesome how God uses you. It would be so electric. It would feel a little bit like a place called heaven. And I just think that is what this humility brings, this opportunity for all of us to run around, to build each other up in truly what we see in our giftedness and truly what we see in our attributes and truly what we find. And man, we become the best forms of each other because we're able to grow in an environment of encouragement. And that's what I I see capable in all of us. What an opportunity. Because in this church, there are people who have greater gifts You have the same gifts as me and a lot of staff, but they're even stronger. Do you realize just because you're on a church staff doesn't mean you have the strongest gift of those gifts? Some of you have greater gifts and God wants to use you in a great way. And some of you are doing it and he is. So I want us to keep going. When you see it, when you pick someone up to encourage them, tell them the truth about what they're doing for you. And so... We build each other up. We lay into each other. And another thing is this, humility when it's applied, when we do this idea that you are greater than me, we're gonna end up serving as leaders. I said, it says serve as a leader. I mean like, hey, if you're a leader, serve, right? If Jesus put it this way. And it's further down the text, John and James have just asked Jesus, hey, can we like uh, sit at your right hand and left hand? And then everybody gets mad at him. And Jesus goes, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. Like they exercise authority and power, but it, shall, it won't be so for you. Whoever would be great among you must, must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You're a CEO, you're a boss, you're a manager. You have something in your life where you are a leader. Serve those people. Serve them. Figure out what their needs are. Help meet those needs. Engage in that servant mentality. Husbands, if you believe you're the, you're the leader of your household, are you washing those dishes? Are you sweeping the floors? Are you keeping that car up? Are you change those dirty diapers? Are you doing the things that your wife needs for you to serve her? Because that's what leadership does. That's how you, and I get it. I talk to guys all the time. You know, Jesus says, you know, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. Well, I'd die for her. Then do it every single day of your life by serving her and dying to yourself. Ladies, the scripture would say, yeah, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. And in this case, are you, are you able to humble yourself so that you're serving them? So that there's this mutual servanthood where suddenly you're working together to meet each other's needs, to bring each other the best life you possibly can because you want to put them before you. They are greater than you. This is the solution to the divisions and the garbage. This is how we show love. I put you first. I put you first. I put your argument first. I put you first. And if you keep doing this, eventually you race to the bottom of a beautiful, deep relationship. And we serve. We serve. Finally, listen and learn from those around you. If we're going to put others and make them greater than us, this is how we get through conflict. This is how we do stuff. Do you realize it's, have you ever met an arrogant teacher, a really, truly arrogant teacher? You've met Haughty teachers, I'm sure, but a truly arrogant teacher you've never met because they don't teach. A truly arrogant teacher hoards their knowledge. A truly humble teacher believes that you can get this. And so they teach. And they try their best. Have you ever met an arrogant learner? They don't learn. Find a man who's wise in his own eyes and it's better for him than a fool, it says in scriptures. Because the humble who realize, even if I think I know this, I'm willing to learn because I may not. And that is the transformative moment when you shift from into a learning and teaching position. Suddenly it's a give and take. It's a reception and a giving. It's a reception and a giving. And suddenly we're filling each other up because we're walking in humility. You see, in all these pictures, whether, whether it's a giving or a taking, whether it's in all of these argumentations or not, the bottom line is the best relationships in all of the world are birthed from acts of mutual humility. 
Do you want a great marriage? Do you want a great friendship? Do you want a great church? Do you want a great dating relationship? Do you want a great, you name it, humble yourself before the Lord and then humble yourself mutually before each other. And when that happens, I guarantee you things change. Confession can be given and forgiveness is, is given. I mean, imagine somebody had to want to come up to you and say, here's $6,000 and pay off. I'm going to deal with your car problem. You would probably go like, that's really hard to receive. That's right, because it takes humility to receive a gift. It takes humility to give a gift. It takes humility to receive a gift. And when we do this mutually, suddenly the whole gears of relationships start. When we put you before me, when you are greater than I, we start to get into a mode of mutual humility. And we should realize that that's how the world runs because that's how we enter into the gospel. It's in humility. And what's crazy is I just preached to you guys an entire sermon that you can't do. You can't do it. Unless you have Christ in you, there's the spirit of humility who dwells in you to enable you to do it, you can't humble yourself. It's not possible. You will do everything for your own intentions, even humble yourself for your own intentions. And the hardest thing is to realize that I have to humble myself before God to receive the ability to humble. It's, it's crazy. But what God has done is he's done everything you need. This is why Christianity begins with humility and ends with humility. You don't earn the gospel. You don't run in going, hey, I've gone to church 100 times. Am I in now, God? I paid a tithe once. No, I don't care if you're the best giver in the church, most faithful member. If we got halls named after you. Everyone gets in the, in the kingdom of God the same way. By bending the knee before the Lord God and saying, I, I can't do this myself. I can't pay for my sins. I can't get my head off myself. I can't love other people rightly. I can't know you, God, on my own. I can't deal with my problems unless you dealt with them first. It's in that act of humility that Christ goes, then here is my gospel. I've paid for that. I'll enable you. I will give you all that you need. You don't clean yourself up. You just receive it. So as we enter in this time of meditation for a few minutes, two things. One, if you're a Christian, bow your heads for a minute and just ask God, God, what is it that you're calling me to? What is in this message? that I need to be humbled with. And, and don't ask him to humble you. That's the wrong prayer. Unless you really want that. You're asking God, give me the ability to humble myself. For those of you here today, maybe you haven't ever received Jesus Christ's gift of forgiveness of your sins, of his work, what he did for you is an act that's a gift and he gives it to you. And it's hard, but you have to humble yourself. And if you're willing to do that and simply ask him today. What, he's, what he wants to do is he wants to give you himself. He wants to give you eternity. Call it heaven. But he offers it to you. And so right now, if that's you and you would like to receive that through his son, it's, it's, you have to humble yourself and simply receive it. Right where you're at, just turn to God and say, God, I'm, I'm incapable of dealing with all my junk. I have sinned against you. I have harmed other people. I've harmed myself. And I am sorry. I wanna receive from you your gift today. It was given on the cross with Jesus. I want to receive the forgiveness of sins. I want to receive the ability to love. I want to receive the ability to remain humble. I trust that you're giving me these things. Will you come into my life now? Will you lead me through it? And all through eternity.
As everybody's pondering your own conversation with God, if you did make a prayer like that and you received Christ today, we would ask that you'd let someone know. And here's what you gotta do. You just, there's some blue cards up there. You can pull those out or you can go to Connection Central or a prayer team. There's three options. If at home, you can just let somebody know online. But right now, it's just an opportunity for you just to take that and, and fill that out and let us know. Otherwise, contemplate and ask the Lord, what is it, God, that you're trying to show me? Who do I need to put before me? Lord, we just pray that you would show us how to do this, how to, how to humble ourselves, God, how to, to partner with you in that. God, I know that you're committed to our humility, and there's an easy way and there's a hard way, God, and we just, we, we want to walk in, in unity with you and say yes to whatever it is that you're asking us to do. So, Lord, we pray that um, you would show us um, areas where where we're not serving others well, areas where we have pride in our hearts, that's where our love is hindered um, because of our pride, because we think we're better than people, because we think our opinions are so important that we put others down. I don't know what it is, God, but I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would be speaking to each one of us this week, because we want to look more like you, Jesus. The humble King. Lord God, I pray you'd help us to become less defensive, that we would just serve, we would serve, we'd go low, we'd serve, and that would be the first thing on our hearts, God. We, we ask you to come and invade our hearts and confront things this week. We want to become more like you. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for leading by example in this. So help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you guys for joining us this week. Um, before you go, I know it's late. Just a few announcements. One, how many of you are members of our church? Okay, not as many as first service. Man, you guys got to get on this. If, if you're not, you can sign up for one of our member classes online, but um, we're having a member vision meeting on June 5th, or it's a celebration. I was told not to call it a meeting. <laughs> um, it's a celebration, and we're going to be just celebrating what has God's been doing in our church over the past year, and we're going to take a look at the future and where, where he's leading us. And so that's uh, June 5th. After the services, lunch will be provided. We're going to have a taco truck. It's going to be awesome. You can RSVP uh, through a link that was sent to you in an email. Um, my second announcement, I'm so bad at remembering them. Oh, you know what? We're going to love on one of our missionaries overseas. We're calling her Lydia for the sake of uh, her safety. But um, if you guys go out uh, to Connection Central, you'll see there's like a, a big piece of artwork that we're all going to be a part of in some way. But if you can go out there, find out what's going on. We're, we need to love on her and her family. Um, I was a missionary for almost five years, and it can be lonely and hard. And all of the encouragement uh, you can get, it's so helpful. I can't tell you. Um, so let's go out there and, and love on her. And then the last thing is that um, VBS is coming up, and we need uh, people to help. And so, I don't know, I, I worked in youth ministry for years too. I, I feel I have such a heart for the next generation, and I know that our, our staff does, and so many of you already serve in our youth ministry. But if you haven't already, please go find a way that you can pour into the kids. Um, introduce them to Jesus, raise them up in Christ, um, just so that we could see a whole nother generation uh, just set on fire for Jesus. So go and do that. Otherwise, we love you.